Hello everybody in Fine Arts 104. Good to be back with you once again on YouTube for the final time. This is the last of the video lectures that you'll have to uh, sit through or put on in the background or however you have been handling this. Uh, after this, we are just taking the final exam next week and uh, that'll be wrapping up the semester. So Actually, why don't I stay on that exact track and just kind of talk about some end-of-the-semester class-related business here. Uh, so your final essay proposals were due just the other day over the weekend, so you should have gotten that uh, into me by midnight Sunday, April 26th. And if it's past that time and date, then make sure you get that into me as soon as possible so I can grade that and get you written feedback. Uh, the full final essay will be due at the end of finals week. You can turn it in up to midnight on Sunday, May 10th. So you've got a two-week period between the uh, submission of the proposal and the submission of the full essay. And then you'll also have a final exam that you'll take on Brightspace next week. Um, that will be like the test that we had taken on Brightspace earlier in the semester, just longer. It'll go back to the start of the semester and try to be comprehensive. And I do want to, I always like doing this. I prefer to do it in class, but obviously that's not super possible right now. Uh, so I'm going to make one of the discussion board posts this week into a, um, a, uh, the topic is going to be question creation. You can go back through uh, the previous tests. You can look through your notes, through the readings, uh, but I would love to see uh, all of you put together a couple of uh, ideas each for questions you would like to see on the final exam. And you can come up with content, format, whatever you want. Uh, my, my thinking behind this is that the more you look back in the planning phase, the easier the exam itself is going to be. Uh, all that being said, uh, May 10th is also going to be the last day that you can submit any work. So make sure that if there's old discussion board posts, old writing assignments, anything like that, that you haven't submitted that, turn it in before uh, May 10th in order to get all the points that you uh, th that are possible before the end of the semester here. Uh, and then uh, I should have final grades calculated and updated on Brightspace uh, probably by about May 13th would be my guess, which is right in the middle of that week after the uh, exam and the essay are due. So all that being said, we do still have uh, more to talk about before we wrap things up here. And this is actually, uh, this week is a little bit of a, a conjoined lesson. This is something that if we hadn't lost some class time due to the uh, coronavirus shutdown, we, we would have separated these. But it's, it's all right, actually, to combine them. They are related topics, our final modes of analysis and interpretation are stardom and authorship. Uh, and what we mean by this is that per this is something that is a critical and academic insight into how we interpret movies, but it's also something that all of us do to a large degree when we are looking for movies to watch or looking at movies to assess. That is looking at who created them, the stars of the movies, as well as the creators of the movies. Sometimes that's one of the same, but not always. Why, why don't we start with stars, uh, which is probably a slightly easier concept for us to think about here or at least a more familiar one. Uh, the star of a movie is usually the most prominent actor involved in that particular movie. And, and movies obviously can have more than one star. Obviously, uh, you think about something like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which came out last summer, uh, the Tarantino film, uh, that obviously had three major stars, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, and Margot Robbie. All of them had uh, different levels of importance within the movie itself. DiCaprio was the lead, Brad Pitt and Robbie were supporting players. And there was a lot of other actors who are fairly well known who are part of the film as well. But those three were the star performers. All of them had worked together in the past. Actually, was that the first time DiCaprio and Pitt worked together? Huh. That might have been the first time DiCaprio and Pitt worked together. That <laughs> mildly surprises me now that I think about it. But all of them are extremely well known. All of them have uh, a, a lot of um, 
they draw a lot of press attention. Uh, they draw a lot of publicity. They are they actually make it easier to publicize. That's where the whole concept of movie stars comes from. Uh, this is a, a process that began over a hundred years ago. Early movie studios started to notice that movies with certain actors tended to draw bigger crowds. They would start getting mail inquiring about the actor or actress that had performed in certain movies. And this was a very big change because prior to the movie age, being a star performer was relatively rare. And oftentimes actors were looked down upon. They were vagrants. They traveled from town to town. They impersonated other people. Like certainly there were famous uh, actors in, in their day and age, but usually there would be like one performer in a generation who would be a star and everyone else was kind of disreputable. Sarah Bernhardt pops into my mind as an example from the late 1800s. Uh, but the idea of movie stars, uh, of uh, a particular actor becoming the focal point of the publicity, as well as to some degree the narrative itself, is something that Hollywood created to help with publicity. Uh, you look at somebody like Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, all from the silent age. These are all actors who essentially developed a persona, a public a, a familiar public image that could be that could show up in the movies and orient audiences to what was happening, what the movie was about, its tone, its genre, these sorts of things, but were also very saleable. A lot of those personas are still very well known uh, a century later. Charlie Chaplin's Little Tramp character is one of those iconic characters, iconic images in American popular culture, even if you've perhaps never seen a Charlie Chaplin movie. Though if you haven't, do so. They're very good. Uh, I would say uh, probably the easiest one to jump in with is Modern Times. If you ever wanted to see a Chaplin film, I think that's on YouTube. Um, but uh, the Little Tramp was there because Chaplin liked the character. He went back to the character an awful lot and was able to craft a lot of stories around the character, but also because people knew the character. They knew the persona, and they if they saw that there was a new Chaplin movie and he was dressed like the Little Tramp, which he played for like 30 years, Sure. Ticket sold. That was the idea behind stardom. Um, and oftentimes, uh, movie stars would develop a sort of synthesis between their celebrity persona and their movie persona. And that's something that I think we can still see today to a large degree. Look at DiCaprio, for example, jumping back to the example of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. His celebrity persona is, uh, for lack of a better word, a playboy. He is somebody who is rich and famous and attractive. He dates much younger women. He apparently is never going to settle down and get married or have a family. He is uh, America's favorite bachelor might be a, a way to describe him. And a lot of times the movie roles that he takes play with or against that public persona. If you look at something like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he's playing a character in that film who is a lot like real-life Leonardo DiCaprio, but without the success. He hasn't had the career highs that DiCaprio has, so DiCaprio's kind of tweaking his celebrity persona in the star persona that he's performing with in the movie. Uh, Brad Pitt is very similar in that movie where he is playing somebody a lot like the traditional Brad Pitt celebrity and and movie persona, uh, but without the same level of professional success within the film. And you can see this in other movies that those two have performed in as well, as well as Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie these days, very much the bombshell persona as a celebrity and in her movies. And I think for the most part, the roles that she has taken have leaned into that, though oftentimes her most acclaimed roles, think of something like her Oscar nomination for I, Tanya. She was playing somebody who was like the bombshell, you know, celebrity persona or archetype, but was messier, was uh, psychologically um, messier, sociologically messier. It was a, a bombshell in a culture, in a time and place where that was self-destructive rather than glamorous. You can also look at something like Leonardo Di DiCaprio in uh, Django Unchained, where he was playing a villain uh, and using his charisma to get you to hate him. You can look at him in The Revenant, a terrible movie that he won an Oscar for by being gritty and not glamorous at all. All of these, the, the role itself is 
dependent upon the movie star persona that's attached to it. You can see it with Brad Pitt, too. If you look at him in something like, oh, I don't know, uh, Burn After Reading, he's playing a big idiot. And he's great at it. God, I love watching Brad Pitt play idiots. He's he's fantastic at it. Um, you look at something like The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, and his persona there is much darker and more mysterious. Still charismatic, but there's a danger lurking under, uh, underneath it. All of that is very much related to the image we have of Brad Pitt, and, and all, of his, all of these roles that I'm mentioning here are playing with how we perceive the star and and how the movie plays with that perception, our idea of who that star is and what they typically are like. Uh, the screening that we would have watched this week that kind of underlined this is a recent Adam Sandler film called Uncut Gems. Uh, Adam Sandler is a super consistent movie star. If you've seen an Adam Sandler movie, you have seen Adam Sandler movies. You've seen kind of all of them at, the, at the, that point, with some exceptions. Um, and, and that is something that filmmakers every once in a while can convince Adam Sandler to play around with. If you watch, say, Punch Drunk Love from 2002, it is the typical Adam Sandler character. In a lot of ways, it's a kind of typical Adam Sandler story, but the director, Paul Thomas Anderson, does not approach it in a typical way, tonally aesthetically, it's much more experimental than Sandler movies typically are. Uncut Gems does a similar sort of thing, where the uh, the directors, the Safdie brothers, use that kind of childish, manic energy that is still so much a part of Adam Sandler's star persona, and turns it on its edge so that the whole movie is just filled with nervous energy, because you can see that just there's a lot of bad choices being made uh and maybe maybe adam sandler's star persona helps underline that because we are used to him being childish to making bad decisions but not having that matter so having him do that in a movie where it very much does matter it's nerve-wracking you can see how the star persona is very much a part of the movie itself uh and so in the, in, in that degree stars can kind of be like a genre unto themselves adam sandler movies are very well understood as Adam Sandler movies. Uh, they're a genre unto themselves, and so when you've got ones that meet some genre criteria, star criteria, but run opposite in others, it can create a lot of um, a lot of material for us to think about as critical film viewers. Now, the related concept here has to do with authorship. That is a very, I, I'm not sure I would call it contentious uh, position any longer, but it certainly has been. It has to do with the question of who, how to phrase this, who is responsible for the artistic vision of the movie? The default assumption these days is that the director is the person in charge. That has not always been the default assumption. Producers, the people who organize the production, get together funding and do the hiring, oftentimes they have been given credit, sometimes very obviously. Screenwriters are given credit as the author of the movie. I think you can make a fair case. Movie stars perhaps deserve a fair amount of credit. Adam Sandler is the author of Adam Sandler movies, maybe more than the writers or directors typically are. Uh, but directors tend to get the credit these days by default because of an idea called the auteur theory. Uh, this is first advanced by French film critics and uh, historians beginning in the 1940s and 50s, saying that directors were the artist solely responsible for the vision of the film that was being created. This was running counter to French tradition at the time, which said that screenwriters were the most important uh, and that directors were just sort of like in charge on the day of. The people who came up with this idea, young film critics like Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, put their money where their mouth was, and they became major film directors in France, beginning in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Uh, and they, in particular, wanted to make movies that expressed their personal outlook. They thought that was what made a director an auteur, as it was called, an, an author in French. Not every director is an author, but their argument, and this was something that was kind of codified by an American film critic named Andrew Serres, was that you could tell a film director was an auteur when they had an identifiable style, when their movies had interior meaning, meaning if you watched more than one film by the same 
filmmaker, or maybe looked at all of their films across their career, you would find very consistent thematic elements. Um, in the case of, uh, say, True Fault, a lot of it has to do with um, how an individual discovers themselves, the process of maturation from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. That was one of the central thematic tenets of Truffaut's filmmaking, and he basically made autobiographical films on those topics for much of the 60s and 70s, along with a lot of other stuff. So they have to have an identifiable style. They're using formal elements in a way that makes you go, oh, this is Truffaut or Godard or Tarantino or Wes Anderson or the Safdie brothers, you know, or, you know, all these names that we've been mentioning here. Um, so identifiable style using formal elements in a way that, you know, signals who they are. They uh, are supposed to have interior meaning. You can see that the filmmakers are exploring related themes, getting deeper, finding new variations on the topics that interest them. Uh, and then the last element in Andrew Saris's postulation here, and the, this is maybe the most basic one, is they have to be technically competent. They have to know what they're doing uh, and create movies that are well-made. Now, to be fair, there are some critics, some audiences who like finding filmmakers who are not technically comp competent uh, and trying to hail them as auteurs. Um, probably the most famous example of this was a atrocious director named Ed Wood back in the 1950s who movies, whose movies were not at all technically competent, not in the slightest, uh, but which were full of stylistic personality and uh, interior meaning. It was not good, but nobody said they had to be. They just had to be works of art, even if they were not high quality works of art. Um, so what this, th this eventually, d just to give you a little bit more of the background here, the auteur theory eventually leads to a revolution where uh, film is taken more seriously as an art form, if not for the auteur theory, this class, this whole field of study might not exist, or at least certainly not the way that it does now. Um, so it, it leads to directors being seen as artists and therefore their output films being seen as art in a way that they hadn't been prior. They might've just been entertainment or propaganda or not even worth thinking about. After that, they become the, the, the province of, uh, university and college humanities departments, um, or standalone film departments. Those are always nice. The other thing that this creates is um, for some directors, they become stars in and of themselves. Quentin Tarantino does show up in his movies. Often he usually plays a cameo role, uh, but typically he is as much a part of the marketing and presentation as anybody else. If you went to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, maybe you went to see it because you really loved DiCaprio or Brad Pitt or Margot Robbie. But just as likely you went to see it because you are a big fan of Quentin Tarantino. Similarly, I have not gotten to the movies very much lately, but I know that when the new Wes Anderson movie comes out, I will have to find the time to go see The French Dispatch. Um, even though I still haven't seen I Love Dogs. I feel bad about that. I'll, I'll catch up at some point. Regardless, uh, what we're really saying here is that the author of the movie is usually a person that you can kind of look to for artistic insight. You can see if there's biographical elements from their life. Uh, that winds up in the film. You can look at the rest of their output and kind of compare and contrast. Martin Scorsese is a really great example of this, or you can look at these similar stories, similar themes throughout his 50-year career at this point. Um, Jesus Christ, that really is 50 years. Um, and, and you can also look at them as just genres unto themselves almost. Uh, a Michael Bay movie, if you've been watching those Lindsay Ellis movies, uh, a Michael Bay movie is identifiably a Michael Bay movie from the go. There's no mistaking it. And again, that's not to say he's good, but he is definitely an auteur. He makes his movies the way he wants to make them. And there is no mistaking them. Consistent style, consistent themes, uh, technically competent on some levels, maybe not narratively, but whatever. Um, that is a measure of the auteur. And that provides a lot of insight, as Lindsay Ellis has talked about, into why the Transformers movies look and feel and think the way that they do. So that can provide you a lot of insight uh, when it comes to your own analysis of films. All right, that will do it for right now. I hope you all uh, have enjoyed the...
the video lectures, the whole class. Uh, good luck with everything that you do in the future, of course. It's been an honor and a privilege to be able to try and teach you a little bit more about this. I, do, I, I wish we could have carried on in the way that we originally had been, but uh, we did our best under the circumstances, I think, and best of luck with everything you do in the future. Stay safe and stay healthy uh, until all of this is passed. And, and, of course, for the rest of your life. Adios.